All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about fish because um, I think, you know, so many people are super excited about fish. And uh, I think the best way to start was thinking about Bailey's question here where she was asking, how often do fish fart? Well, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that digestive gases are consolidated with feces and expelled in gelatinous tubes. So fish do not fart. I know my... A uh, four-year-old boy would be very sad to hear about that. But uh, you do see uh, fish bubbling air out of their butts at times, and that's um, sand sharks will gulp air and release air out of their anus to regulate their buoyancy. Um, herring, herring are little, you know, tiny little fish uh, in the ocean can bubble air through their butts to communicate a little bit. So. Um, are they like truly digestive gases? No, but there are some some ways that they, they use that. Anyway, thought that was fun. Good question, Bailey. All right, now, um, so if we were to break all the different fishes that we find into functional feeding groups like we did in the invertebrates, we'd essentially just have three things that are um, invertebrate, invertivores, right? A fish that are eating bugs, piscivores, um, fish that are eating fish or uh, herbivores. Uh, really, this is just not useful, right? So yes, we do have lots of invertivore, invertivorous fish. This is a, um, oof, is it a rainbow darter? I think it's a rainbow darter, maybe um, similar species. Um, uh, they're only gonna eat inverts. A gar is only gonna eat other fish. Um, this is, a, I believe, a central stone roller that is only gonna be eating uh, uh, a paraphyton material, right? But really what we see is most fish are really omnivorous. So when we started, when we um, dissected that carp way in the beginning of the semester, what we saw were these pharyngeal teeth. I don't know if you remember these things that we got at the, the, that back um, gill arch. Um, in part of the jaw, right? Um, in actually, sorry, no, it's not part of the jaw. It's um, part of the gill arches. And remember, this is bone. This is not enamel. And there was that little plate that the organisms were um, grinding that upon. What we see, though, is most fish are really there's very very few herbivorous fish, and this is really kind of weird because you might think there are so many plants, right? And if you look on, um, you know, and most ecosystems, most of the biomass is plants. And that's even true in riverine systems. There's a whole lot of macrophytes, uh, but only 55 out of 700 species in North America are herbivorous. Now, this might be really weird, um, given that, you know, in terrestrial ecosystems, most everything is herbivor herbivores. Right, and then we have a few carnivores or predators above that. But um, South America, there's more, um, quite a lot more. Um, think of the flood pulse concept. We'll talk about that in uh, in the next lecture. Um, but essentially, what we see is in the big tropical rivers, you see more access to the floodplain and the terrestrial food web, thus having uh, more uh, species that are going to be taking advantage of macrophytes. Uh, and then overall, worldwide, um, we see rivers have lost access to their floodplain, so there's much fewer plants, macrophytes, that they're able to um, get at. So um, I'll come back to this Tambiki in a second. Um, really, what we see is most fish don't have those mechanisms. So go back. These teeth that we see, the pharyngeal teeth, most fish really don't have anything that, that is like that. Um, really for a fish to be eating plants it really needs something to rupture the cell walls and digest that plant matter and so unless you have a fish with pharyngeal teeth so the families that we do see those pharyngeal teeth are really not that many minnows, cichlids, suckers, catfish, and uh, chirassids uh, these are family that only really is found in the tropics um, you need to start with that, and most fish just have pointy teeth. They don't that you know grab onto stuff. That they don't have the grinding like molars that we see 
in all herbivorous mammals, basically. Uh, you need to have a muscular stomach, kind of think of like a gizzard or something, right? So now some of these fishes will have muscular stomachs and longer intestines so that they can digest that hard to digest plant material. Um, but realistically, there's a lot of, um, just, just we don't see these adaptations in, um, in fishes. And now you might ask, well, why is that, right? They've had just as much time to evolve. Um, and at, as, as terrestrial organisms, right, they've had the same amount of time to evolve, but they just haven't really, there's only a few families that have evolved some of these systems to be able to eat plant matter. One of the like um, fishes that has been able to do this is the tambiki. That's in the genus Colosoma. Um, it's this really big fish uh, it, that's found in the Amazon River Basin. And if you look at their teeth, their teeth are crazy. It's basically, think about like your molars and then all of their teeth are like molars. Um, they don't have like the pointy teeth like a, um, like a pike or a walleye does. Their, um, all, their whole mouths are full of these molars and that they're able to eat fruits and nuts that are falling off trees into the flooded, um, into the flooded Amazon River. So they're going to be living in the floodplain and for, um, you know, one re of the reasons that they're able to be found is that they, um, or that, that they can only live in the Amazon River or in some of the tributaries of the Amazon River is because they need that super long flood, right? Almost their entirety of their diet is fruits and nuts that are falling from trees into the water and without you know, a consistent flood that lasts six months, you know, most of those fruits and nuts would just fall into the ground and then, you know, decay in the ground. But when they're falling in the water, then the fish are able to get to it. I was really fortunate enough to eat this fish in Columbia one time. Um, it was pretty cool because it was this big. They just put it on a grill, the whole thing. Um, well, they, well, they gutted it first and then they put the whole fish on a grill and it was the best fish I've ever had. Um, it was uh, so delicious and you know it's basically just e e eating fruit all day so um, you can imagine that the t uh, the meat was extremely tender and very um, just had a really mild taste that was just really good. So if you ever have a chance to eat it if you're in the, the Amazon River Basin go for it. It's um, definitely a good experience. Anyway, again, we don't see herbivory. And remember, when I'm talking about herbivory, I'm talking about eating macrophytes, like big plants, actual vascular plants that we find. Um, uh, but if we look at then, you know, other types of feeding groups, what we can kind of make uh, some generalizations about is that in smaller order streams, we find aerial insect eaters. So think about a stream that's like, you know, up in a mountain that is a headwater, right? There hasn't really been a lot of time for anything to accumulate in the river. So we see aerial insect eaters. So this is, um, this is a trout going after a fly, right? Well, why do trouts um, eat flies is because they're used to eating insects that land on top of the water and then um, food from outside the stream, basically. Then, really, uh, realistically, the only other food source is a bunch of paraphytes. And so you'll see a lot of little um, scraping fish that will, you know, pretty small fish that will be eating paraphyton up in these, in these streams. As the stream gets bigger then, we see there's a greater role of invertivores. And then as the river gets really big, you see a lot of detritivores. So blue cats, general cats, um, uh, this is a river carp sucker here, where they're basically eating all the ooze and all the like dead stuff that's at the bottom of the stream. Um, but there also are plenty of invertivores, plenty of in insect eaters, and plenty of paraphyton. Um, basically, as you go down in the stream, the more fish species that you'll get. And this is a relatively common um, thing that we see, right? So as the stream watershed, drainage basin area gets bigger, the number of species goes up, 
right? This is from um, on the U.S. and Gulf of Mexico coast, um, and we see that more species or bigger areas just house more species of fish. And you know, this is worldwide. We see Amazon River up here has by far the most species. Realize that this is a log scale, so this is a lot higher than down here. Um, So when we think about what species are where, um, really think about, so, so why do we have a certain fish species in a certain area? There's a global species pool that gets filtered by historical access. We talked about that a little bit in the last lecture. That then, uh, so that brings us down to a regional species pool of like fish that ha are in the river basin. Those, that gets further uh, filtered by the habitat constraints, so that is the correct habitat in that specific um, area. So we get a habitat species pool. But then, you know, there, there might be all the right habitats, but there's certain interactions where there's too much competition for, for one species, which eliminates um, some species or predators eliminate some species, and we actually get the actual thriving residents. So that is um, why we see at times really interesting um, uh, distributions of certain fish species. Um, so Hawaii is a really interesting example where Hawaii is this volcanic island, right? They've, it's been isolated for, from any freshwater source for, for the entirety of its time, right? So it, not surprisingly, that lacks any native true freshwater taxon. Now we have brought largemouth bass and brown trout to Hawaii, but um, there's really no freshwater taxa that have made it there on their own. All of them are descended from marine species and all of them are diadromous, meaning that they um, go back to the sea for part of their life cycle um, to either mate or to grow up bigger. Uh, and we see that there's um, basically five species of fish. I'm not really sure how to pronounce this word. Oh, oh, who? I don't know. But that's the the different species of fish. They're all relatively related to each other, um, and that's the entirety of the, the fish fauna of the Hawaiian Islands. But as you can imagine, this is repeated in pretty much any um, oceanic island that you see. Um, really. Um, you know, limited species of fishes in those those rivers. Even though you know there might be relatively big rivers on these islands, um, there's not going to be a super huge fish community. All right, that's it for uh, uh, fret loaded fish. Um, check back later for more videos.